want any feedback. Okay. Um, so climate change is something that we talk about as if it's going to happen in the future. Uh, we talk about, you know, projections of temperature change that are supposed to occur by 2100. And we hear about not wanting to, you know, reach that two degree threshold um, as one of our goals. And so here, what you can see, um, this graphic done by Ed Hawkins at the Hadley Center, is showing you the global average sea surface temperature for the entire globe. And you can see that in every month and every year, the temperature has already warmed. Um, and we've almost, we're almost halfway to that two degree um, temperature threshold. So I'm a fishery scientist at um, Stony Brook University on the main campus. And I um, have been studying the effects of climate change on fisheries in the Northeast US and um, hope to make this a little bit of a New York focus for this crowd. Um, so the first hypothesized response of warming um, is that mobile species like fishes or other, um, other mobile organisms can just simply move poleward. So as waters warm, uh, fish that, that can move will just move northward or poleward to remain within their preferred temperature range. And in this way, those mobile species can adjust. And so um, about 10 years ago, I, when I was starting my postdoc at the NOAA lab in Woods Hole, I, uh, we set out to determine if this, if we were starting to see the signs of climate change. And so the Northeast Fishery Science Center uh, has been conducting a trawl survey since the 1960s that goes from Cape Hatteras down here, um, all through the, the Mid-Atlantic, Georges Bank, Gulf of Maine, and even waters up into Canada. And so every year um, in the spring and the fall, they'll occupy about 300 to 400 stations. Uh, they'll, we do the same thing that fishermen do. We throw a net over the back of the boat. Uh, we, we have like a 20 minute tow, and then we count and weigh and measure all of those fish uh, that come up in the tow. And importantly, uh, we scientists have recorded the latitude and longitude. So we have almost a 50 year time series of where um, those, those species are. And so it's this kind of monitoring that's really invaluable to be able to detect changes that have occurred because of climate change. And so I arrived at NOAA in Woods Hold uh, to analyze that data. Fortunately, you know, it's not a big pile of, of data, but rather in a nice database. But still, it was a lot of, lot of uh, data to make sense of. We looked at 36 different species, um, and I'll show you some of the patterns that we saw. So to summarize, uh, 24 of the 36 fish stocks that we looked at already showed signs of shifts in distribution that were consistent with the climate change. So again, they were moving poleward or to deeper depths. I'll start with one example, the yellowtail flounder. Yellowtail flounder, you know, as you know, is this bottom uh, dwelling fish. It's not, um, it does move around, of course, but it's not um, one of those fish that has a, a large migration. Uh, pattern. And so you can see in the 60s and 70s that yellowtail flounder was really abundant off of Long Island. The red areas indicate very high abundances or biomass, and the blue areas indicate where we sampled, but we didn't catch any um, yellowtail flounder. So then if you fast forward uh, 40 years later, you can see um, the shift that has dramatically occurred, so where we no longer find yellowtail flounder off of Long Island, but um, we do find them in Georges Bank and Gulf of Maine. So in between this, these two time periods, yellowtail flounder was severely overfished, um, but what has happened is the, the species has recovered um, quite nicely in the northern part of its range, but has not recovered in the southern New England area. Another similar pattern we see uh, with silver hake. This is a, 
a much more mobile species, as you can see. This is a, a much more fusiform fish. Um, silver hake has a northern, northern southern migration in the spring and the fall. And so in the 60s and the 70s, again, you can see that this fish is highly abundant off of um, Long Island. Not very many fish in the Gulf of Maine here. Um, and even some abundance down as far down south as North Carolina. But if you fast forward 40 years later, now you see very few silver hake down here. Um, lower abundances in the southern New England area and then most of the, the stock is in this area. And so what does this mean for our fisheries? Well, um, this is the landings of yellowtail flounder uh, by state. And so you can see New York in yellow, where we had a, um, a very uh, profitable active fishery in New York in the 60s and 70s. Um, maybe this was the last gasp of the fishery. And then again, um, you know, after that uh, overfishing failure of this fish stock to recover. And so there's an important interaction between fishing pressure and climate. For Atlantic mackerel, um, what I'm showing you here in the black dots is the historical distribution of Atlantic mackerel, where it supported an important fishery off of the Delmarva area, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia area. But the gray circles are the current distribution of Atlantic mackerel. So uh, these fish just don't come as far south in the winter anymore. They don't need to because um, it's not quite as cold uh, up north. And that has affected uh, the fisheries. So now in Virginia, Maryland, and New Jersey, uh, you can see that those fisheries essentially stopped in the early 2000s. Um, and most of the fishery, I think the southernmost um, fishing fleet for mackerel is in New Jersey now, um, while most of the landings come from Maine and, and Massachusetts. So how do, the, how do fisheries adapt to, to this? Um, what I'm showing you here is the mean latitude of the fish shown in the black line here. So you can see over time, using the same trawl survey data that um, the fish are being found progressively at higher latitudes. But the landings, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to see in gray, um, have increased latitudes. So fishermen are having to go further north to catch the same species, but they're not, qu they're not uh, shifting quite as much as a fish. And uh, this, is, this was for red hake, but you can see for all of the uh, fish studies that Pin Malin Pinsky and um, Mike Fogarty studied. Uh, again, you see all of the lobster and fish moving northward, and then the fishery not quite keeping up with um, how quickly the fish are moving. <coughs> and that's probably because um, a lot of the infrastructure, the, um, the, the ports, the seafood plants, um, the other seafood dealers are, you know, it's very difficult to move that infrastructure. And so what happens is that um, uh, a lot of times fishermen uh, will switch uh, the kind of species that they're catching if they're able to. So this, this work was done um, in 2000. This was published in 2012. And as we all know, 2012 was a particularly rough year. This was the year that Sandy hit, um, something very um, close to, to many of us. And um, this, is, this is the flooding that occurred after Sandy, which is probably what we mostly remember. However, 2012 was also the warmest year on record in the North Atlantic. Um, so here what I'm showing you are the temperature anomalies in 2012 um, for the whole northern, well, almost the whole northern hemisphere. And you can see that in our area, those dark red colors mean it was two to three degrees warmer than um, it had ever been, at least for the period that we have um, sea surface temperature records. Um, and this is warming that was comparable to predictions that we have for the end of the century. So my colleagues and I um, uh, found some, this was a great opportunity to study like what might happen when uh, at the end of the century when we do have this persistent two to three 
degree warmer ecosystem. Um, and the Gulf of Maine, in particular, had warmed faster than 99% of the global ocean. And that's partly because in 2003, um, it was a relatively cold year. Um, and then the water temperature just rapidly increased. So you can see the long-term average in black, but then um, for that, this decade, it, it warmed um, much, much faster. And so this had a profound effect on the ecosystem, particularly lobster. So lobster, um, you know, their migration inshore and offshore is tightly tied to temperature. So lobster migrated earlier into the Gulf of Maine. The fishermen picked up on that right away and started catching lobster earlier and in great, great abundance. Um, and so they uh, caught so many lobster that they basically f like flooded the market. Uh, the prices went down and uh, you know, instead of sort of stopping to fish, they caught more lobsters, of course, to kind of to make up for the really low price. And so eventually what happened is that um, the only seafood plant or the only lobster processing plants for lobster were in Canada. And so um, the Canadian uh, seafood plants were saying, you know, we're not going to take any more U.S. lobster. So literally lobster was just rotting on the docks. So there were really profound socioeconomic consequences because of this ocean heat wave that we had not anticipated and had not experienced before. Um, this also affected Atlantic cod. Atlantic cod, as you know, is um, a really important fishery for the identity of New England and even the nation. I mean, arguably, we won the Revolutionary War because of the, the revenue from Atlantic cod. And in, the, in 2012, 2013, the cod uh, in the Gulf of Maine collapsed. Uh, you can see that here, where in blue, the spawning stock biomass, or the adult population of cod, um, had been declining since the 80s, and recruitment, uh, shown in green, had also been declining, but you can see that from 2003 to uh, about 2014, a really rapid decline that coincided with that really rapid warming that occurred from 2003 to 2012. And so, um, of course, we wondered if this, this uh, collapse of cod was related to um, the rapid warming. And so what we did was develop a model uh, where we uh, made recruitment as a function of spawning stock biomass, the adults, and temperature. And typically in fisheries management, we don't include the effects of the environment. We don't include the effects of temperature um, on recruitment and don't include that in our models, which ultimately determine harvest. And so if you don't use temperature in the model, this is what you get. Um, the gray lines are our model, and you can see that it does not line up with this green line, which is what we're trying to do. And that's because it's only, to, only using spawning stock biomass, only using the number of, of adults to, to calculate what recruitment should be. And so the managers for Atlantic Cod were given overly optimistic advice. They sort of thought recruitment should be up here and maybe harvest could stay uh, high, but in reality, recruitment was much lower. So our model with temperature in it actually predicted the recruitment much better than the model without. So now you can see the red lines line up with those green lines um, much, much better. And so if we had uh, included temperature in our stock assessment model, our population model, we might have been able to give managers um, a little bit better advice. But the, the consequence of this is that now the temperature uh, is as important for the recovery of Atlantic cod as the fishing pressure. And so to illustrate this, what we did was use our model um, and then make different projections based on um, uh, likely scenarios of temperature change. So the temperature um, might, you know, the temperature increase might um, remain on the same trajectory, which would still be a very rapid warning, but it, it might stay on, that would be our extreme scenario. Um, 
global climate models suggest maybe uh, a, you know, less than a, a degree of warming, and then this would be um, sort of the most optimistic scenario where we have just a half a degree of warming by 2040. And so this is the, the projected recovery of Atlantic cod with no fishing. Um, so that means you can't catch cod as bycatch either. And so under a, a cool scenario, the most optimistic scenario, um, by you know, 2025, the stock gets above this dotted uh, line, which is what is the current sustainable uh, target for um, cod fishing. So the stock does recover. Um, under the warm scenario, it takes a little bit longer for the, the cod to recover, but they still recover. But under the extremist scenario, they never really recover. And so again, fishing and temperature determine the, um, the recovery of the stock. And so you can see um, with no fishing, which is what I just showed you, under the cooler warm scenario, it takes about 12, 12 years for the stock to recover. Under the hot scenario, it takes 14 years. With a little bit of fishing, so um, an F of 0.1 is just really, really, really low fishing. It takes 15 to 16 years for the cod to recover under cool or warm scenarios. And uh, for the hot scenario, they never, it takes greater than 32 years for them to recover. So they probably never really get to that historical um, level. And under high fishing, and again, this is not really, F of 0.25 is not really a high um, fishing level, but the cod never recovers. Um, does anyone know what the F of Atlantic cod was estimated from the last stock assessment? How many people guess it's greater than 0.25? <laughs> Um, I shouldn't laugh, but the, the current F is 0.932. So we're way, way above um, what the fishing limit should be. And part of that is because the stock is just at such a low level. And even though most of the cod caught is as bycatch in haddock or yellowtail flounder fisheries, um, it's, it's nearly impossible to keep the um, fishing level um, as low as it should be. And so, you know, let that sink in for a minute. Cape Cod is named for this species and, um, you know, Cape Cod is not likely to be extirpated from the Gulf of Maine or Cape Cod, but it's, it's gonna be a very rare species there in the future. Um, it's not all bad news. So this is the black sea bass. Uh, this is a really fun fish to study. It is the northernmost serranid or grouper species in the northeast U.S. And so my students and I have been working on this for a few years. And when we started to work on this species, um, we did what most uh, fishery scientists do, and we consulted a book called The Fishes of the Gulf of Maine, which has the life history information, diet, migration, fishing habits of, of all the fishes that are um, found in the Gulf of Maine, and it was uh, written by Bigelow and Schroeder in the 1950s, the experts um, at the time. And they wrote, there is no reason to suppose that they, meaning black sea bass, would ever succeed in reproducing themselves in the Gulf of Maine or in establishing a temporary foothold, even if the rare migrants should spawn there. So, you know, the straggling, the straggler black sea bass have always been found in the, in the Gulf of Maine, usually adults, but no juveniles have, had ever been found there in the, in the 1950s. And they went on to say that they're too scarce to be of any importance for fishery in the Gulf of Maine. Um, you know, they've always been a valuable fishery south of Cape Cod and in Long Island, um, but never in the Gulf of Maine. So I want to let that sink in a little bit. Uh, the, the experts in the 1950s would never have conceived of the idea that a fishery might be um, discussed and emerging in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so I'm going to try to show you a movie. So notice that black sea bass is really abundant off of Long Island in those red colors. 
And then we're going to um, see their shift in distribution to the 2000s. And so you can see in the late 90s, they get abundant in Long Island, which if anybody fishes, you know that. And it might be difficult to see, but you're starting, you start to see a higher and higher abundance in the Gulf of Maine. Um, yeah, and so, and so if you look at the juveniles in the Gulf of Maine from the same survey, you can see that um, now we're start starting to routinely find juvenile black sea bass um, in the Gulf of Maine, which is, it's a good thing because this can now be um, a fishery in the Gulf of Maine. It's very abundant off of Long Island, but fisheries has to, fisheries management has to be adaptable to allow fishermen to catch those and be able to potentially switch um, gear and licenses to catch these emerging fisheries. Similarly, with summer flounder, in the 60s and 70s, they were very abundant off of North Carolina. And then if you fast forward to uh, the most recent time period, you can see that they're not very abundant at the southern part of their range, but very abundant um, off of Long Island. And in particular, you know, we're starting to see more and more summer flounder in the Georges Bank, where again, there's always been the rare migrant, but never um, really a, a, an established population there. And so both of these, black sea bass and summer flounder, may be really good news um, um, and are doing better in our neck of the woods because of warming. Um, the other, th other work that my lab has been doing um, is looking at changes in the timing of the season. So does spring get earlier? Um, and, it, and it has the spring temperatures warm up about a week earlier than they did in the 60s. Um, and summers, but the more important and the more sort of um, dominant trend is that the summers are getting longer. So now what this map is showing you is uh, the colors are days of the year, or days per year. So you can see in the Gulf of Maine, which I've been talking quite a lot about, um, you know, about two, um, a little over two days per year, um, over about 30 years. Uh, so, so some summers are about a month longer in the Gulf of Maine. And in New England, where we are in the yellow, is about you know, one, one day per year, a rate of one day per year uh, of prolonged summer. And so um, summer is about two weeks longer in southern New England. And so some of you may have seen this headline or heard this on the radio. Have you noticed that our beaches stayed uh, open longer the last past few years? So that's good for us, you know, all of us like to go to the beach. Um, but, you know, towns and beaches have to then have lifeguards and, and, and that infrastructure for a little bit longer. So again, it's not all bad news. Um, and so what I'm showing you here again is the, the sea surface temperature um, increase since the 1980s. And this was that 2012 uh, heat wave that we discussed. Now, as a scientist, when I looked at this figure, what I assumed would happen is, you know, this was an, an anomaly, right, a, a, a one-off. And so I kind of expected temperatures to, to come back down to this level or maybe lower. That's what we're used to seeing. Um, but the temperature has stayed warm. And so um, we're continuing to look at this. And uh, what, what I worry has happened is we sort of entered our, a, a new phase where, um, you know, the average temperature in our new normal is just this warmer, um, one to one and a half degree warmer sea surface temperature. And this is, this, these are projections from global climate models. This is a high resolution global climate model. And so with a doubling of um, CO2, you can see that the areas where, that are gonna warm the fastest, um, the Northeast US is going to be one of the fastest warming areas. Um, so the, that red area is a, a, about a five degree uh, temperature change. So these, 
what, I, you know, what I'm trying to say is that these changes have already happened and they're going to continue to happen. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my lab group. These are um, the students in my lab that have really done the hard work on these studies and my funding sources. And I'll leave you with that. We have quite a bit of time for questions. My name is Daniel Carpin. I've been fishing for the last 60 years and uh, since I've been a child. So here's some of my observations. My last yellow tail flounder I caught was, I think, the fall of 1973 outside the Northport Power Plant on North. Hmm. That sent, never seen a yellow tail flounder since which confirms your graph showing north uh, yellowtail flounder being very abundant in the 60s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. The winter found flounder was a tremendous fishery in Lloyd Harbor, where I live. And on election day, 1976, uh, I went out fishing and brought home 38 flounders weighing 25 pounds, filled up a bucket. My mother said, where do all these fish come? Well, I said, I just anchored my boat 50 feet from the edge of the Spartina Marsh, my little rowboat, and fished for the whole afternoon, brought home a bucket of fish. In 1990, the flounder pop, winter flounder uh, population in Long Island Sound crashed. I have given up trying to catch winter flounders in the spring or fall because they simply aren't there any longer. They aren't there. Black sea bass used to never be found in the North Shore. But about 15 years ago, I started catching them in Lloyd Harbor and Cold Spring Harbor in those areas. Summer flounder used to be never in Long Island Sound, almost never, but about 15 to 20 years ago, started catching them in Lloyd Harbor and also they're in Cold Spring Harbor. So from a fisherman's point of view, everything you're saying is absolutely true. Thank you. Well, this is, um, it's really interesting to hear your, your uh, stories, but, you know, in terms of climate change, this is something fishermen and, and scientists tend to agree on. And I've caught probably 20,000 fish in the six, last 60 years, so I know how to catch them. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> one afternoon sna catching snapper blues in Lloyd Harbor, I brought home 218 in an afternoon of snapper blue fishing. Of course, today that would be totally illegal. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is actually regarding the winter flounder. Have you done uh, the similar assessments on their d abundance and distribution? Yeah, winter flounder is interesting. Um, uh, because they have been so heavily fished, they actually, in the Gulf of Maine, uh, moved south. And actually, so has cod because they sort of, you know, were spread out. They're so abundant and they're spread out. And then as they get overfished, they come back, you know, to sort of their center of, of biomass, which is off of Gloucester, which is so not very smart. But um, <laughs> so there's a little bit of controversy as to whether climate or fishing has affected winter flounder. Um, Mike Frisk, my colleague at Stony Brook, would argue that overfishing is the primary cause. And, and certainly overfishing is the dominant um, stressor on marine fishes. Um, but he thinks it's probably um, sort of an indirect effect of um, an increase in predators on winter flounder because of warming and that has increased predation um, and that's been why winter flower, flounder has not been able to recover. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, um, in the early, 19, around 1990, the Canadians uh, banned the uh, fishing of cod off the Grand Banks. And as far as I'm aware, and I, I would appreciate it if you could comment, um, that was almost 30 years ago, have the cod come back? And if not, why not? Yeah, so there were actually, in the same year that we published the, the work on Gulf of Maine uh, cod, where they had crashed, they, there was another paper stu uh, published that suggests that there has been a little glimmer of hope for the northern cod off of Canada. 
um, and some signs of recovery. And so it's uh, the same story, just the flip side of the coin where it's been a little bit warmer there. They've seen increases in capelin, which is um, really important for prey, for cod. And um, they, yeah, they haven't, uh, it's still not to the level that they could fish at. It's still not at a mm -hmm. sustainable level, but there is a little bit, a glimmer of hope. Um, but it's been, yeah, at least 20 years where um, there's been essentially no fishing or very little fishing on cod there. Just was wondering if you'd like to put into perspective it's, uh, your, your perspective on it's not all that bad. Uh, there's a lot more we have to worry regarding climate change than, than to be um, uh, praising. Uh, you know, so I, just the, the emphasis of your presentation was it's not all that bad, extended summers, you know, the, the, we'll, we'll fish this species instead of that one. I mean, you know, from, from sea level rise to ocean acidification to pests to hurricanes uh, and beyond, we have a lot more to worry about regarding climate change than, than, than we uh, can, can be hopeful about. So I just wanted to you know, ask you to put a little bit of perspective on that. Uh, certainly. I, you know, it's something that I worry about um, every day, especially, you know, I have kids and I wonder what the world is going to look like for them. But um, I, I, I don't like to just give a doom and gloom talk about climate change because there, there are things that we can do. We can, there are things that um, we can do to adapt to climate change. There, we've shown from this research that there are things managers can do, um, and we can make fisheries more adaptable so that fishermen and our coastal communities can adapt to these changes. Um, but, uh, you know, we have to do something about emissions soon. We should have done something about uh, emissions soon, or um, this can really spiral out of control. Agreed. There's, there's legislation in New York State called the Climate Community Protection Act, which, if it gets passed, uh, could, could help quite a bit with, with reducing emissions in New York State. Climate and Community Protection Act. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. My question relates to the relationship between air temperature and water temperature. So can you speak a little bit to do the two of them track very closely to one another or, or does the water temperature experience a delay, I assume, and how long and how does that vary with depth as well? Yeah, so um, for shallow bodies of water, the, the, the water temperature tracks air temperature pretty well and we've actually been able to use that that relationship to understand what might happen to marine organisms and estuaries. Um, in the ocean, where I do most of my work, um, there are definitely important atmospheric processes that affect temperature. So actually that 2012 heat wave was very strongly influenced by air temperature and, and things in the atmosphere, but there's also, you know, you can think of it almost like 50% of the, of the variability in temperature um, from oceanographic processes. So, you know, the, the bottom waters are insulated from the air, and so the factors that affect bottom temperature um, are, much, are a little bit different than the surface temperature. And on the continental shelf, how, how would you define shallow? Um, so I would consider shallow like 10, 10 to 15 meters. 30 feet. You in, the know. Species, in the species you talked about today, they would, their habitat would be within that range? They're, they're, they can be found in that, those areas. So summer flounder can be found as the, those shallow areas, but um, a lot like cod and yellowtail flounder are typically found a little bit further offshore um, and really throughout the um, ocean. So like the edges of a lot of those maps are about um, 200 to 300 meters where the, the continental shelf kind of drops off. All right, no other questions? Janet, thank you.